ignoring the issue is something which we can't do. You might not wish to embrace a transhumanist stance, but you need to take the issue seriously. Hello, everybody. My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio. This week, our guest is German professor and philosopher Stefan Sorgner, who has extensively studied and written about the topic of transhumanism, which is commonly defined as a movement that promotes the use of technology to enhance the capabilities of humans. Stefan's work on the subject includes his 2020 book on transhumanism, his recently released book, We Have Always Been Cyborgs, and a collection of peer-reviewed articles, including his publication entitled Nietzsche, the Overhuman, and Transhumanism. In this conversation, Stefan and I discuss the key ideas that are central to transhumanism, including how the movement differs from traditional approaches to societal improvement, the bad ideas that exist within the movement that need to be corrected, the cultural differences in the perception of transhumanism that exist between different regions such as America, Europe, and the East, and finally, the deep importance of data ownership and privacy. And I think that's all you need to know to get us started, so let's just jump into it. Everyone, please welcome to the Feedback Loop, Stefan Sorgner. Well, to get started, let's be good philosophers, I guess, and define things. And on that note, how would you define transhumanism? (laughs) Transhumanism is a cultural movement. It's a philosophical movement whose primary goal is the usage of technologies in order to break away from our current limitations. And why should we do so? Well, because moving beyond our current limitations increases the likelihood of us living good lives. And breaking away from our current boundaries concerning human means, increasing the likelihood so that the post-human comes about. And that's sort of the, the central core of transhumanism from how I see it. And that's also a way of how one can clearly distinguish it, for example, from, with, from bioliberals. Bioliberals sometimes have even more, even a stronger moral stance concerning the usage of some technologies like selecting fertilized eggs after pre-implantation diagnosis and in vitro fertilization, like someone like Julian Savolescu, who's very close to transhumanism, but he's, he doesn't regard himself, he doesn't define himself as a transhumanist, but he thinks we've got to, parents have a moral obligation to choose the best fertilized eggs after IVF and PGD. And and this is this is a very strong moral stand. So one can see that actually as a transhumanist endeavor, but it's not his primary goal. He doesn't regard it as a goal that one actually moves beyond our current limitations so that the post-human comes about. And so that's that's why I see this element as a core of transhumanism. So bi- many bioliberals and transhumanists are actually very close to each other, but, but those who define themselves as transhumanists should actually have the goal, you know, breaking away, f- breaking away from our current boundaries um, so that the likelihood of the post-human to come into existence gets realized. And who the post-human is, is, is a rather open question sort of the post-human could be still a member of the human species, but having at least one capacity which significantly goes beyond our current capacities. It could be a member of a new carbonate-based species, sort of an evolutionary um, development, but us still being embodied beings, but it could also be an uploaded personality or a Mm -hmm. digital entity on a hard drive. So it's, it's, it's even an open question within the transhumanist community um, how they define the trans, uh, the posthuman. So it's it's up to the individual tr- uh, transhumanist how the posthuman actually gets defined. So to be clear, you you would say posthuman is something that is beyond transhuman, correct? The 
the the transhuman and that's sort of the way how fm uh, 2030 also defined mm -hmm. it the transhuman is still a human who's on the way of moving beyond our current limitations significantly moving um, beyond our current limitations so someone a world record holder in long jump you know could be seen you know should be seen as a transhuman it's already he, you know the person has already achieved something which goes beyond our current limitation but it doesn't go significantly move beyond our current limitation and the post-human would be someone so instead of jumping nine meters um would have to jump 10 you know 10 or maybe 50 meters so or develop a new capacity um having the capacity to see ultraviolet rays for example yeah and so that is so it's it's a it's a continuity and so clearly the trans and the post-human are not clearly actually conceptually separated because it's a continuous development however um this is this is this is so as long as the the, the distinction or the difference uh, concerning what we can currently do is not so bad uh, it's not so big then, then the person would still be regarded as a transhuman, but the posthuman would have to have a you know significantly different capacity, at least one. Yeah. So, so you said that in previous interviews, I believe that you were attracted to transhumanism after leaving religion, and that your version of transhumanism was weakly inspired by Nietzsche. What what makes your version of transhumanism Nietzschean? Uh, what what does that mean? So actually, most transhumanists, uh, many transhumanists in the Anglo-American world actually have engaged with analytic philosophy, have dealt with utilitarianism, and 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 I'm I'm neither I'm not a utilitarian. Um, I have got I've you know dealt with analytic philosophical approaches, but this is not sort of the tradition I belong to. There is quite a clear separation. Um, between sort of the Anglo-American world um, concerning philosophical issues and the and the sort of European continental way of dealing with these issues, the analytical world is very much focused on very precise issues, focused on you know precise questions which, which get analyzed in great detail. Um, on the other hand, then there's a European continental tradition which asks you know, which deals with all the great questions, cultural issues, religion, does God exist, and so on. And I mean, I've personally dealt with both traditions, and I can see the benefits also of both traditions. But my, my main point of reference is Nietzsche, and Nietzsche clearly belongs to this European continental philosophical approach. And he is within this tradition, he is one of very few thinkers who take evolution seriously. Mm. and to take a, a non-dualistic ontological stance, a, a monistic ontological stance, meaning he does not assume that humans uh, possess a divine spark, an immaterial divine spark, which is categorically separated from our sensually accessible body. Um, and this is basically the, the most fundamental paradigm, which, which you know, thinkers in the in the european continental philosophical tradition have agreed upon that's actually the fundamental paradigm of within the western within the western cultural world which has become dominant which is still dominant in most legal constitutions all over the world and and by taking that stance that we are non-dualistic entities that sort of mind and body are both essentially in principle essentially accessible are are not substantially different there's not this gap between the material body and the material mind and this is a stance which you know he shared with spinoza and heraclitus uh, which nietzsche shared with spinoza heraclitus and that's also a, a you know that's also an ontological approach which i i affirm so that's a proper evolutionary understanding humans came about as a consequence of you know evolutionary processes and now we, by means of the late, in particular, by means of the latest technologies, we've got the possibility to enhance evolution. But in a way, we've all we've always been doing so. In a way, I mean, education is already, uh, uh, you know, is already um, is already a technology, and um, education is a technology our parents have been using on us, our our educators have been using on uh, on us, and this is this has benefited us enormously. 
you know, without education, without language, without mathematics, without knowledge of history, philosophy, and so on, you know, we, we, we couldn't live the good lives we are living. We, you know, we need these capacities for planning purposes. And basically what these technologies enable us to do in, you know, so far will get improved even further by means of the latest technologies. So using gene technologies, brain computer interfaces, is is a continued is a continuity of what we've we've been doing all along since we became Homo sapiens, and that's kind of why you would argue in your twenty twenty one book we have always been cyborgs. That whether it's been you know using a stick to get ants out of the ground or glasses or you know smartphones, all of these different tools have been part of this evolutionary journey. Uh, to manifest that, I guess, evolutionary goal. Exactly. Um, the book, yeah, we've always been cyborg. That's sort of a comprehensive introduction to to transhumanism, but it also provides therein also provi provide my my own stance, my own philosophical stance concerning transhumanism. And it, it was published, yes, in at the end of 2021. Actually, in the book, it's written 2022, just to be precise. So it, it came out earlier this year. And yes, we've always been cyborgs means, means exactly this. So cyborgs come from the ancient Greek um, cyber organism. Cyber comes from Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a helmsman, the steers person of a ship. So we've always been steered organisms. And, you know, what was the initial steering process which we had to go through? Well, our parents upgraded us with language. When we, we, we were born, we might have the organic capacities for developing language, but we, we, were we, we didn't possess any language. So our first and, and most important upgrade, which took place at the right at the beginning was us getting language. And in the traditional paradigm, it was it sort of it was the idea that it it, it that's it you know we 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 are capable of using language and we possess language as a consequence of you know God attaching a divine spark to our body and which happens at the time when fertilization occurs. That's at least what the Catholic Church has said uh, uh, since the second half of the 18th century of the 19th century, actually before that, the Catholic Church took a, took a different stance. But yes, um, and, and, the, and, and my, 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 you know, my stance, an evolutionary point of that means, no, it's not, it's not coming from outside our capacity to speak, our capacity of using language, of possessing language, of, of, you know, tech, of language being a technology which is part of our organism. That's, that's our first upgrade. That's sort of a parental upgrade. Um, so, our, you know, we became human, um, we became homo sapiens as a consequence of that upgrade, which again is a complex interplay of, of um, educational and genetic processes of, and, and in the end, now we've developed the capacity because our parents, because our cultural circumstances teach us that mm -hmm. capacity. And so it's a technology which, is, which becomes actually integrated into our organism, which becomes part of our body. And, and we develop further capacities in, as part of the educational processes we go through in school. And now, you know, we've realized sort of brain computer interfaces, digitalization and gene technologies, and using them is just in line with what we've always been doing. So we shouldn't be as afraid of them as many people seem, still seem to be. And we should be much, much more open. And if you look back in, 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 you know, in our cultural history, sort of there have always been people, whenever a new technology came about, there have always been people who thought, no, this will bring about the end of humanity. This will, will kill all of us. I mean, when in the, in the 19th century, sort of the trains got established initially. There were, there, were, there were priests in the UK who said, well, the train goes so fast, that's extremely risky because it will separate the soul from the body. The soul cannot catch up with the, with the fast movement of the body. And well, this doesn't ha didn't happen. And um, so um, we've got good reasons actually to be, to, to be much more hopeful and optimistic um, concerning or positive concerning the possibilities of of new technologies, because when we see 
all the benefits we've managed to realize, in particular in the past 200 years, as a consequence of, of developing and using these new technologies, have been enormous. They've really significantly increased the quality of all of our lives in all, all different parts of the world. And with the latest technologies, you know, of course, they're extremely powerful and, and there are always risks connected to them. So it's a matter of, you know, it's, it's a matter of how we use them, whether we use them within in, in our interests. So we do need to take care of that issues. But developing them in the first place is, is clearly something that stands. We should be very proactive concerning doing so because they significantly improve the quality of all of our lives. And that's that's another, I think, sort of another core element which transhumanists share. Given that we have so closely evolved with tools, whether it's, you know, the tools of the mind with language or actual tools and the benefits that that has given our species, why do you think there's that skin bag bias? Why do you think people are still so attached to the idea that we have to be inside these forms and that the path we're going on is is one that's so scary? Is it just mm -hmm. about survival, fear of change, like philosophically? What, what are your thoughts on why we we don't accept a movement towards something that seems to be an improvement? Well, the reactions towards transhumanism and also to its emerging technologies in general, I guess, are really strong, strongly culture dependent. And if, you, if I compare the reactions like in Silicon Valley to the reactions um, or to the, to the normative, to the ethical stance, um, people have concerning these technologies in Eastern Asia and in, 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 in continental Europe, they are significantly different. And um, a wonderful, wonderful example or an example I really like a lot is um, um, something which happened about, you know, that was, must have been already five, six years ago when I, when I was in, um, in, in Taiwan, in, in Taipei. And, and there I met a, um, a young boy, he was, you know, 15, 15, 16, I guess, 15 then. Um, he came from Silicon Valley and he, he was represented, he's a biohacker and he played around with, with CRISPR and he was using CRISPR in order to create real vegan cheese. So he was playing around with yeast using CRISPR uh, no, uh, and used yeast uh, to turn it into lactose. So by means of a genetic modification, he as a biohacker managed to create lactose based on, on yeast. And with the lactose, he created, well, um, proper vegan cheese, which actually tastes like the cheese we, which we all like based on, based on the traditional cow milk cheese. Um, and, and so that, that would be a proper vegan cheese. It's not a vegan cheese based based upon almond or almond milk or some other, you know, um, um, hazelnut milk or whatever, soya milk. Um, so it, it really makes a difference concerning the taste. And um, and and the audience in 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 Taiwan was in was enormously enormously positive. They they were like embracing the idea that this is wonderful what you've managed to realize, you know, at the age of 15 together with your biohacking group in Silicon Valley. That's just that will change the world. That that will have uh, enormous positive and, and enormous potential. That will also show that there doesn't have to be a conflict concerning proper, you know, green green ends and goals and 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 um, and tech, you know, and new technologies like like gene technologies, like genome editing, CRISPR, and they were just absolutely enthusiastic about that. And they wanted to take pictures with, with the young boy. And I thought, you know, this is also, of course they also realized now it's, it's, it's a wonderful invention, but also, you know, multi-million dollar business, it's got an enormous potential. And so, and so their reaction, so the reaction of the, of the young Eastern, Eastern Asian students is, you know, was very optimistic. It was very positive concerning these new technology here in this case, uh, gene technologies. When I, when I mentioned the same story in the continental European context, it, it's the reaction I usually get is, well, this young boy didn't really have a use, you know, he should have, you know, used a little drum and run around the Christmas tree. He didn't, instead he was given the tools to, 
uh, you know, wipe off, destroy humanity from, from the earth, which is enormously risky. And he will regret all of this, you know, having wasted his use. And it's, it's, it's a total nightmare. And so, um, I mean, because of the risk, it's a nightmare because of the risk connected to use these cheating technologies. You shouldn't have done that in the first place. So, um, you know, the hesitation concerning emerging technologies is, is much more is much more strongly in 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 European in continental Europe um, rather than in the Anglo-American or Eastern Asian world. So, uh, so it's it's there's not such a general hesitation. You know, there are also some hesitation, obviously, in the US and, and in Eastern Asia, but but it's 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 significantly less strong than in continental Europe. And um, here in continental Europe, I'm, I mean, I come from Germany, and in the German-speaking countries, it's it's particularly strong. Um, because of the German um, history, which has happened in the Third Reich in particular, because here's the idea again of, you know, um, 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 you know, eugenic practices. There's also the idea of, of, of um, creating injustices, global injustices, which is another very strong, very, there's the, the very of us playing, playing God, doing something which we shouldn't do in the first place. So, so there, there are a lot of, so because of Christianity being, being extremely strong, that is, that is a reason why, that's one significant reason concerning the hesitation. Another significant hesitation is because it sort of has resonances. It seems what transhumanists affirm from their perspective, seems to have resonances concerning, you know, eugenic practice in the third rise, which it doesn't have at all because it's it's a you know transhumanism is so closely and clearly connected with you know with liberalism, maybe even libertarianism. So it's it's a, it's a really absurd, very. But that's something which one needs to demonstrate very often, particularly in the German context, but also in the continental European context. And thirdly, there is um, the important worry from sort of. Um, from, from left and green side, which says now it undermines global um, global justice and also it eradicates sort of the sort of they see a very strong distinction between the natural and the non-natural and both of these worries and actually all of these worries don't properly ap apply and but these are the ones I'm I'm I'm, I'm primarily concerned with so I I think these are the ones which are um, most strongly embedded in the European continental context. And furthermore, on a political side, you know, liberalism or the, the norm of negative freedom has never been particularly strong, actually, in, the, in, in continental Europe. And I mean, I, I work at an American university, at John Cabot University in Rome. So, um, and, and, and I realized sort of what is, widely shared among US American students is, is a much higher respect for, for negative freedom um, than, than how I know this from the sort of the from from you know in particular the German context, but also in Italy and so on. And so that already these are probably the you know the, the central elements which are particularly um, important when one when one talks about reservations and um, hesitations concerning embracing transhumanism. Yeah, do you, do you think some of that <clears throat> hesitation also comes from the perception that transhumanists have this almost blind lust towards perfection? You know, you were talking before about eugenics, okay. and we were talking about religion. You know, it, it, is transhumanism doing a bad job of? presenting itself as something that is more nuanced rather than something that's just trying to create the uber mensch, you know, the perfect man. Exactly. That, that, this is a very important point. Um, so transhumanism seems to be so closely connected with, with a very strong ideal, a Renaissance ideal of, of perfection, of creating, well, the uber mensch, of creating, you know, and uh, uber mensch, but in a very in a very naive manner, in, in, in a way of creating Superman on Viagra or Wonder Woman on Botox, um, you know, um, a hyper, a hyper Renaissance ideal, basically, as if all the transhumanists were in favor. This is what, uh, this is all what transhumanism is about. And th there, there might be some, there are some transhumanists who actually do affirm such an ideal, you know, this is so, but, but it's important to stress 
that this is definitely not shared by all transhumanists and, and sort of the, the range of ethical ideals which is shared within the, in the transhumanist community is much broader. For example, I'm extremely critical of these, these strong ideals concerning what it means to live a good life. I don't think there's, we can say anything um, uh, which actually applies to all people um, concerning the question what it means to to live a good life you know there's there's some issues which i think do apply to many people maybe most people and here the most important element is that of an increased health span you know and and i refer to psychological studies and these psychological studies normally show that if you ask people you know do you want to live longer healthily then the majority of people replies, yes, this is, this is, I identify this with increasing my quality of life. And some, some regard that as in, instrumentally helpful for increasing their quality of life in the sense, it's not something which is in itself valuable, but it helps them maybe then to achieve further goals, which, which they identify with the good lives. Uh, for some, it's, it, it, it um, being healthy and living longer in itself is already a capacity which they identify with with a better quality of life. So, but what is important that an increased health span is actually something which the majority of people, more than 90% of people in some way see as beneficial for their quality of lives. And this is, you know, there are some people who, who, who disagree and, um, I can see why they disagree, and I can see why one can be in a stance to disagree. Of course, when you're, you know, um, when you have a very bad type of cancer, and for example, even some 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 drugs don't manage to get rid of, you know, the suffering which goes along with it, then um, um, then yes, um, then your quality of life might not be sufficiently good. Um, and then you would, you know, want to end your lives, maybe mm -hmm. um, commit suicide and or ask for physician assisted suicide. Um, but, um, but if you're healthy, um, and, and you live longer than then this is, you know, um, if someone's healthy, um, most people just don't want to don't want to die under yeah. such circumstances. They just look for the, you know, look forward to the next cookie the next day, the next special cheesecake uh, and a cappuccino well prepared. And this is what keeps them going. You know, another experience of a, of a wonderful bottle of Chianti, you know? And this is what, you know, uh, keeps them going and keeps them alive. And that's sufficient. Um, so, so, so I think, um, if one talks about the issue of the good lives, then an increased health span is probably the element which is shared by most people. But otherwise, there's just an enormous plurality what people identify with a good life. And I think, uh, yeah, um, they should have the right to do so. They should have the right also to use technologies in order to, to realize their specific understanding of how, what they identify with the good lives. Of course, with the prerequisite that, you know, um, it has to stop when they start directly start harming other people. So everyone should have the right to do so as long as you don't directly harm another person. And, um, you know, many of the goals can be significant, can be realized or their realization can be promoted significantly by means of emerging technologies. And so that's definitely stands concerning transhumanism, which is very far removed from any kind of, you know, um, you know, hyper Renaissance idea. Yeah. Do, do you think that that uh, sp specifically when I think of like what's going to drive transhumanism, I do think of that kind of uh, resistance to death as a main motivator. There's there's always going to be people who want the latest technology if it means they can live a little bit longer, uh, live a healthier life with less suffering. Do you think that that kind of motivational force will make transhumanism largely inevitable? Like that is is this trajectory one that we're almost guaranteed to go down? Maybe for that health reason, or maybe for other reasons. I think that might be the most important factor which will make people aware of the relevance of transhumanism. But even if you, I mean, the, so if you look at what truck companies invest invest in or what the government invests in concerning dealing with, concerning dealing with um, um, diseases, then the most investments go 
um, into research like cancer research, HIV, um, Parkinson, Alzheimer, and um, that's that's very important, obviously. And, and um, however, one, one could also directly tackle the issue of aging, and sort of to try to undo aging, which is which are usually the processes which, in the long term, um, lead to diseases like um, cancer, uh, cancer. Uh, Alzheimer, Parkinson, and so on. And so, and sort of this anti-aging industry, I think it's growing and more and more people start to realize the relevance of undoing aging research. But if you actually look at the statistics concerning how much money is invested in, in these fields, it, it's still little in comparison to, to other industries like, you know, like the can, you know, the truck, drug industry, which deals, which tries to, tries to cure cancer. Um, and so I guess it's, it's still a matter of time. Um, one needs to have one example, which clearly demonstrates to, to many people, which makes many people aware of the potential of, of undoing aging research. And once one has that example, I think many more people and any more people who are in charge of you know, the financial issues will start to realize more money should be in, invested in in this type of research, and 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 then then one also realizes further further realizes the potential you know the, the, of the of the transhumanist approach in general, and but one one has to make them aware sort of there's a lot of people are afraid when they hear the word transhumanism and that was also the reason why you know the World Transhumanist Association renamed themselves to Humanity Plus. And because when they hear transhumanism, there there's not such a positive response to that. So it's it's really branding. It's 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 a, an advertisement issue. But um, I still I think it makes sense to 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 use it also in order to highlight the differences concerning the traditional approaches. And one one needs to make sure one one gets in a one one you know one one presents a proper a plausible stance concerning transhumanism it's not you know just about you know making making people immortal by means of mind uploading you no know, and there's or one achieves like a, a hyper renaissance ideal by doing so and it's just something for the rich people in in switzerland and in singapore and um no but it has it it, it, it it's actually some people, some transhumanists might have that in mind, but that definitely does not correspond to, to the, you know, to, to the masses of the, of the permanently growing transhumanist community. And there's much more plurality, in particular when one talks about, you know, the ideal of the good life. And what is most important, it has nothing to do with having any kind of, you know, paternalistic or totalitarian implications. It's rather the country to this, it, it really, it's sort of very, it, it's open to new developments. Or whenever new new insights come in, one needs to adapt them. That's, you know, this pragmatic stance, that is so characteristic of, you know, having an empirical stance, a scientific stance. Whenever new information comes in, then one needs to adapt one's goals or one's, one's political um, decisions concerning how one reach, how one wishes to reach one's goals. And so it, it's much more pragmatic and um, definitely not dogmatic. It hasn't any totalitarian or paternalistic implications, but it's it's a liberal approach which tries to promote the plurality of human flourishing, and 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 the traditional approaches. They are the dangerous one. They are the ones who claim they have an answer to all the question what makes every every human being happy. They they want to tell people how they should live their their lives, and that's really dangerous. This has you know paternalistic, totalitarian, and maybe even fascist implication. And, but transhumanism is just the contrary to that. And um, I, I think more and more, you know, one, one, hopefully one, one manages to get this I idea across in a, in a clearer fashion. So that sort of the widely shared worries concerning um, transhumanism sort of get reduced. And I think then people will realize, no, you know, this is, it is something which many people act upon anyway or feel plausible anyway in their everyday lives and then they manage to associate sort of what they what they feel sympathetic for and what they live according to um, with transhumanism and then then its importance will will grow even further yeah you mentioned the the tension there between 
kind of the transhumanist worldview, hopefully with some nuance and the traditional worldview that has kind of this uh, uh, arrogance about it in terms of knowing all the answers. What I really often worry about, you know, as somebody who has called himself a transhumanist in the past and still, you know, believes in a lot of the ideas is we're, we're getting all of these tools, but we're still operating in those traditional cultural value systems. We're still engaging the world with that older mindset, but we're becoming more powerful. And I worry that we won't have like the, I guess, conscious evolution, the, the emotional maturity to guide our transhuman trajectory, our transformation into that flourishing that you talked about. And instead we'll lead it into something that is much more like dystopian. Is that something that you worry about? And and have you had thoughts on how to reconcile it? This resonates very strongly with me, what you just said. And, and I think you're perfectly right. So, and there are many examples which, you know, clearly demonstrate that our, our cultural, the cultural constructs in, in which we live, and they actually stop us from realizing a lot of the potential and it's, it's important to to undo them to change them and to make people aware of of the implications of the cultural paradigms which are still embedded within you know many legal systems i mean the most important one is i guess i guess the the concept of personhood and so if you look at the concept of personhood in, in you know in legal in constitutions all over the world there are very few exceptions in most cases you say it you know personhood is only something which only applies to human beings and um and in well the, there's one exception in in the past couple of years in argentina there was like uh, the the court case where the, where the, where they granted personhood to an orangutan and as a, as a consequence the orangutan had to be freed from the zoo so this is one exception but but there were many court cases both in the us also in in, in many european countries which you know where they tried to um where, where they investigated whether personhood should apply to to some apes and it it was always declined so personhood is so strongly connected to to us as to human beings only and that is an anthropocentric bias which is a strong cultural cultural challenge which we need to deal with but there are many other examples actually um where a lot has happened already but uh, where a lot still ought to be done and i mean if you see the reaction concerning um like um, same-sex marriage, fifty you know, fifty years ago, it was homosexuality was still criminalized in most parts of the world, and um, nowadays, in many many countries, at least, we've moved towards towards um, marriage for all. It's called something, but it's it's not that natural law ideal which used to be upheld in the tradition Christian tradition for so long. It's you know, one woman and uh, one. Uh, man and one wo woman coming together and then having offspring in the traditional me method and that's the only way and only if they want to have offspring they should have sex you know this is this has been sort of the central traditional ideal and, and it's still connected in a way with the understanding that you know uh, marriage also being limited still to two people and but now we've got the technological possibility to having a child with three biological parents and we should move away from that so if and that's also so uh, moving away from that, there's a natural ideal what constitutes marriage. So it's an ideal. Well, marriage is just a contract, and um, it's in their interest because they have got a, a, a legal institution. They've established a legal um, institution among themselves, which grants them special rights. But it's also um, it's also in the interest of the of the state uh, of of. Of, of a government because if one of the people if one of the street people four people gets ill and cannot continue working then the others have have the have the legal duty to support the other person so it's also in the financial interest to even expand the notion of marriage uh, to more than two people it's in the interest of the government it's in in the interest of the people involved it's a win-win situation so um and this, these are only two examples which clearly demonstrate that our cultural constructs are, are still strongly related to, you know, the, the Judeo-Christian past, which has so strongly um, structured the world around us and also the cultural world. So we still live in the in the cultural relics of, of our monotheistic past, and um, we should move away from that. And that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that. Um, 
you know, monotheistic religions have to be, you know, uh, should be seen as dangerous or should be rejected. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, no, um, you know, um, one should move away from this. There are any kind of, you know, fundamentalist, any kind of dogmatic understanding have a validity on a legal basis. I wouldn't want a skeptic or a naturalist to be like dogmatically, uh, dogmatically dominant on a legal level either. So, you know, the legal level and the moral level um, and, or the, and the religious, they should be clearly separated from each other. And, and um, so dogmatism, is, dogmatism leads to, to, to totalitarianism, paternalism, and fascism. Dogmatism is really dangerous. So uh, um, the proper, you know, state, liberal state would have to have the openness to what other people think about you know how they want to live a good life and and that's that this is should also be more highlighted more often by transhuman because that would be a proper transhumanist stance and that's at least the stance i'm trying to to promote much further yeah as as we think about how to both culturally and technologically maybe force those conversations or transform these traditional systems into something that's more transhumanist more nuanced you know less uh, totalitarian as you said um w what are the risks that exist in terms of the ways humans can screw this up because when i think about engineering ourselves and humans having the power to change themselves in their society which obviously we've kind of always done but as we become more powerful at really truly being able to be the steersman and, and change our, our trajectory how much do you worry about the fact that we might not really know what we want? We might not know what's best for us. We might steer ourselves in a bad direction because we simply aren't that self-aware. That can always happen. And, there, and, and there, there are certain risks actually connected to that. But they are particularly connected if such people um, become powerful. So that's one needs to find a good, proper you know, legisl legislation, making sure that sort of that liberal understanding is firmly rooted or well, one needs to have a strong social basis in order to undermine any kind of these, um, and, and, you know, that like totalitarian leaders coming into becoming dominant in a, in a liberal democratic, in a liberal democratic society. Um, but otherwise, so if it just, so because in, in the position of power, they are making, they've got the right to make decision for other people. And that's when it becomes dangerous. Um, of, and, and you could wonder, well, about people making bad decisions for themselves. Well, people are making bad decisions for themselves all the time. That's, we have the right to do so, and we should have the right to do so. And maybe, you know, it's, it, other people might never know what is actually in the interest of, you know, of oneself. And, um, and, and, um, you know, people have the right to fail. Um, the important, the important issue is that one needs to, what one needs to reduce the chance of them harming others. And so, it, it, you know, you could. I think people have the right to harm themselves as long as they don't harm other people. And and that's sort of what needs to be prevented. So one, once other people are involved, or once larger gener, you know, groups of people are involved, then it's it's one needs to have a, a clear social dis, you know, one 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 has to have a democratic discussion concerning where the appropriate limits are. But otherwise, you know, there's there's the issue of, um, there, there was a discussion, con, you know, a couple of years ago, which was a strong discussion. Um, there was the deaf left, lesbian couple. Um, they both work in a in a at a at a university. A university professors and and they regard deafness um, not as a as a disease, but merely as a being different. And they wanted to have a, a on, on purpose. They wanted to have a deaf child um, because they saw well the deaf child deafness is not a disease. Deafness is not a handicap. It's merely a being different. And um, it's actually the deaf child, it would be in, in the advantage of the child to being deaf in the community because we live in a deaf community. We've got a better way of relating to each other. And, and you know, there, there was a strong outrage, you know, concerning their wish of, of having such a deaf child. And many people might, when they initially come across the case, sort of wonder how can they do this to the child? That it's, you know, at least a very, I think a widely shared reaction 
which one uh, comes. By the way, the, 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 the couple was granted that right. They, they were, um, um, they um, got, they, they, a friend of theirs who was from the deaf community was also working as a professor at the same university, um, who was deaf for many generations, functioned at, at the, as a sperm donor. And so they actually, they, they were able to use, you know, um, um, this technology and to consciously increase the chance of having a deaf child. And um, so initially the response might be, well, how can they do this to the child? But they're not actually doing anything to the child. This is what, what, what one needs to realize because you actually, you would only harm the child if you actually, you know, took away something which the child already possesses. So if the child is hearing and then you made the child deaf, that would, would involve some kind of harm because you've got a capacity which you take away afterwards. However, in that case, it's, it's merely the question of, um, you know, um, can it be seen or should it be seen as harming um, if, 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 you know, a couple wants to bring about, to bring about a deaf child? Is, 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 is being deaf, being born deaf, uh, alive, not worthy of being lived? And that's clearly not the case. You know, a deaf child can be, you know, much happier than a hearing one. You just don't know what the outcomes will be. And, and the important thing is it's, it's not a harm being done to the individual because harming someone means you remove something, you take away a capacity which, uh, which the entity pr uh, possessed before. In addition, it's not a wish which is widely shared that, you know, you know one, one shouldn't have the worry of bringing about an entire, you know, deaf, you know, that everyone will suddenly have that wish. It's a plurality and it's good that there's a great plurality of wishes so that we have a very diverse society. Actually, um, um, there are studies which show that we, it, 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 if people live in, in very noisy uh, um, environments, there are actually people dying from hearing, you know, from, from, from noise. And um, maybe in certain circumstances, deafness can be even seen as an advantage. But that's not the decisive issue. The decisive issue is, uh, and it is to realize, no, no, the, what, what the parents are doing, they're not harming a child by consciously increasing the likelihood of bringing about a deaf child. And, um, and um, so that's, a, that's a, just a, an, appropriate, an appropriate choice which the parents should have. And, and, and that should be in tune with transhumanists. And I, I'm aware that not all transhumanists agree with me on that issue, but if one, uh, uh, um, but I, I think there are many good arguments and I've just shown, you know, just mentioned a few of them, which demonstrate why um, that should be an option which should also be in tune with transhumanism. And that leads to a lot of interesting thoughts and further reflections concerning the concept of, you know, being handicapped or, or what a disease is in general. And, and it also leads to, I think it's also a way of actually leading to less discrimination if one takes such a very pluralistic and open stance and non-formal stance concerning what it means to live a good life. And so, um, in, in, a, in a society with less dim, dim, discrimination, less violence concerning the individual happens, and that increases the overall flourishing as well. Yeah, l let's talk more about the, the broader ethical and regulatory aspects to this. What, what are some of the other concerns that you might have in terms of, you know, what are the ethical concerns, I guess, in general, and what do you think about how much regulation there should be, how much should people be able to tell this couple they can't have a deaf child, or how much should people be able to tell the kid he can't gene edit cheese because he might, you know, create a, a super virus. How, what's your thoughts on the ethics and regulations of all of this? I guess the most important issue, and that's actually an issue with which, with, with which I'm extremely concerned with, which I also dealt with in detail in the book, We've Always Been Cyborgs, is sort of um, how we deal and what the meaning of digital data is. How should we deal with digital data? Um, should we collect it? Who should collect it? Who should they have the right to collect it, to access the data? How much data is needed for, for research purposes? How important are digital data for research in the fields of um, undoing aging, for, for, for dealing with diseases in general, for policymaking, for research in the social sciences and the natural sciences. 
And um, I think um, I think sort of the economists who stress that digital data or data is in new oil, they are correct in a way. Obviously, um, data is not oil. Oil is a natural substance, and digital data is intellectual property. So they are two different entities if you if we want to classify them. However, they've got the same function in society. They both are relevant for you know for power, for making money. They are both incredibly important for you know research purposes. So yes, they're both they're they're both related to a lot of different aspects, which which you know can be identified as power. And so th that's why there's a fight happening all over the world. Maybe it, one could even call it as as there's a war concerning digital data already taking place, and we've seen that when. Um, concerning the regulations, concerning the, the um, how the US reacted to Huawei, um, but also concerning you know with TikTok is is another crucial issue. Um, but we should also take Alibaba in uh, the Chinese Alibaba into consideration, and so and so there's already a sort of a war concerning digital data which is taking place. And and there are different ways of dealing with that issue. So in the in the US, we've got the we've got a very liberal, maybe even libertarian version of dealing with that. So basically, it's it's in, in particular the big companies, you know, the global players was Google and and Facebook who, who who collect the data and then exchange the data, sell the data, and so on. So and as a consequence, they become also politically quite important you know, figures and institutions so we've that's a very liberal uh, way of dealing with digital data in in europe in the european union they've established G gdpr uh, the general data protection act um so there is enormous importance of of on an enormous focus on privacy and it's very difficult actually it's not impossible it's extremely difficult to collect digital data and um, because I think sort of privacy is extremely important for increasing the you know chance of living good lives. And then on the other hand, we've got China as another major player, and and China is is probably the most efficient country in so far in in you know and having the possibility of collecting digital data. You know, about ten years ago, they started to to establish the Chinese social credit system, and that was. By the way, no, that was dealt with in, in a wonderful man, manner in the Black Mirror episode No Stive. So anyone who hasn't seen the, the, the Black Mirror episode No Stive, watch it. It's it's wonderful. But it's even surpassed in reality by what the Chinese have been doing for about 10 years. And so um, they are collecting. They, they've got the right to collect the data from all the very different companies and institutions. And um, if, the, if you're um, a company and you don't want to give the government the data, then you don't have the right to function in, in China. So their method of collecting data is even more efficient than, than, than the US way of dealing with that. And by the way, as a consequence of that fight concerning digital data, it is um, the, 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 the global internet has been destroyed. The internet is no longer a global institution. We've got the, we've not only got the Chinese wall, but we've also got the Chinese firewall. And basically, so uh, the Chinese have the right, and only the Chinese have the right to, to collect the data within China. But China has also got a lot of, you know, with Alibaba, WeChat, um, TikTok, and Huawei, they've got the possibility of collecting the data all over the world and the rest of the world. So they, they, they get data within China and, and outside of China. But it's important, it's, it's no longer, the internet is no longer a global institution. It's a wrong way to conceptualize the internet. And, and <clears throat> this has implications concerning sort of how, how we want to structure the internet um, uh, and how we want to benefit from the, from the information and the power which goes along with digital data. So how should we deal with digital data? <clears throat> is digital data actually is, is there a conflict between digital data and and freedom does if, if if we give up privacy if we crown someone the right to collect digital data does that mean that it undermines our freedom and i i don't think that has to be the case it just it's a matter of how that gets structured politically so the question concerning the meaning of digital data is one which i regard 
as the most important one which we currently have to deal with and have to focus on. And, and, and because it's so utterly relevant, we really, I, th I think many people, even who've grown up in the, in the digital age, um, don't realize the full impact and relevance of collecting digital data and what can already be done in that respect. And there's much more enlightenment, much more knowledge has to be, has to be revealed to the broader audience concerning how effective, how, how efficient, how, um, how, how strong, you know, digital data and, 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 and digitalization is when it comes to digital data. It's, 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 it's not, I don't think we have to be worried, you know, for the time being that a, that a digital super intelligence will put it into a zoo. You know, I'm not excluding the possibility that will happen eventually, but that's not, you know, even Hawkins and Musk and others, you know, they talk about that very as if, you know, as if it was was just around the corner in the next 10, 20 years. I don't, you know, you know I, it is a very, you, you should have in mind, but, you know, that's not one of the pressing issues of our time. One of the pressing issues of our times is, you know, how do we, should we deal with digital data? Who has access to it? And I think the European way of dealing with that is, is just absolutely wrong, wrong in the sense of not morally wrong, but wrong in the sense, it's not in the interest of the European Union. Because if you don't collect the data, that means you undermine, you know, probably the, you know, the most important, the most important aspect for becoming powerful, for, for you know, making money, you know, and, and what happens if if the EU doesn't you know enable their companies to 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 flourish financially? Then obviously less money will also be available for social benefits. The possibility is you know what is a wonderful achievement is is like the private um, uh, the the public the pe public health insurances which are available in the European in all countries of the European Union. That's a wonderful achievement because that's what we all you know what we all share the majority of people in see an increased health span with a better quality of life. That's why I think we should have a uh, public health insurance. And it's part of a, of, a, of a governmental duty to establish because we care for that. The majority of people care for that. And, um, but if there's less money available, um, if the money goes to the, you know, goes to China, be, um, and then basically um, less social benefits can also be provided in, in, in Europe. Um, and but not it, it doesn't remain on that level. It also has the implication that you know we will we will not be as well as with respect to other countries as we used to be. And if 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 in a country we see ourselves, we, we see well the Chinese, you know, have you know can take much better vacations, have uh, make much more money, and have better social benefits than us. Then um, then we look for scapegoats. Then we yeah. want to blame someone, and and the ones to you know, which usually get claimed, uh, you know, the members of minority groups, immigrants, the weak other in general, and that leads, and, and the stronger that development gets, and usually it tackles first, sort of the first to feel the impact of a financial crisis is the middle middle class. So that, then, then, the, then the conflict will increase, the conflict between, you know, minority groups, whatever, the weak others in general, and the middle class, and that will lead to and that will lead to civil war. You know, this is sort of the this is a real worry which I have. And but so so on the one hand, we've got an enormous challenge when it comes financial challenge by not collecting digital data. But actually, um, that's only the first step. And what I, I think is in an even even more very young aspect is is sort of when it comes to the military influence. So you know, um, and and the military influence has to do with the political influence. So. You, um, China is making more money, is fl flourishing further economically, and as a consequence, it will have more money to invest in in military purpose. It will, you know, it will develop better military measures. They're already expanding with a new Silk Road. They, they're already expanding in many, you know, in particular many African countries as well, which is, and as a consequence of them becoming more. More, more, more powerful. In, they have the possibility of investing more in the military technologies, and, and that will that will enable them to increase their 
their, their political realm of influence. And that means, well, um, and, and their under political structures are not consistent with sort of the achievements of the enlightenment with, with what, what we regard as beneficial for an appropriate political structure. You know, we cherish freedom enormously. And as a consequence, but, but if they have more money, they invest more in military power, and that, that will enable them to increase the political influence, their political influence, and also to promote more authoritarian political structures in, in larger parts of the world. And so basically it leads to the, you know, one thinks we, the European thing, you know, we cherish, we cherish privacy. We want to undermine the possibility of collecting digital data because privacy is important for freedom. And they, and, you know, given these reflections are plausible, you know, it will show actually um, not collecting digital data leads to the coming about or to making stronger authoritarian political structures. You know, it undermines the, you know, the original ideal, um, political ideal, which they had in mind. So it actually, because it makes liberal democracies weaker or social liberal democracies weaker, financially weaker, they cannot uphold their political power either because money is relevant for social benefits. Money is relevant for military purposes. Money is relevant simply if you want to be recognized on a par with, with, uh, with, with um, political, you know, with uh, other political, uh, with political structures in other countries. Yeah. So, um, so not collecting um, digital data might make you, from a very naive point of view, make you sort of the morally better person. Um, but it does not, um, because it sort of undermines the initial interest you, you uh, well, it, it might, it will undermine the interest you initially had to promote liberal democracies, but uh, it does not in the country. And so, but it's still an open question, how should we deal with digital data collection? What is the meaning of digital data? How important is it? Is it really the new oil? And I think there are so many good reasons which dem demonstrate that it is. And that means we need to take that issue far more seriously. So the very is not that, that, uh, um, that a digital super intelligence within the next 10 years will put us into a zoo. Um, that is not one of the most pressing issues of our times. So those who think so, it, the, the, it's, it's like, it's like the debate, you know, which people in the Middle Ages had, where people um, where people discussed how many how many angels fit on the tip of a needle, and of course it made sense in medieval times. You know, angels exist, and if, if angels exist, you want to know how big is an angel, how many can you fit on the tip of a needle. Uh, it, it fully makes sense from the basis of, of their cultural backgrounds. And nowadays, it's sort of living in our you know, natural scientific technological age, it fully makes sense to discuss the possibility of conscious AIs and body days eyes mm -hmm. and, 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 and the coming about of super intelligence. It's a fascinating discussion to have. However, it is not one of the pressing issues of our times. It, it, it has no currently no practical relevance whatsoever. We really should, you know, discuss the issue of the meaning of digital data because this is of enormous pressing relevance for all of us today and has an immediate impact, you know, for the world we, which we live in. And if we cherish freedom, if we cherish living in, you know, some kind of liberal society, we should take that issue much more seriously than we we do nowadays. And we also and. And so it, it obviously collecting digital data comes along with very problematic instances. So ever, whoever has access to this data, you know, there's a great risk of you for, for them using them using the data and the power which goes along with them in their own interest. And we need to prevent that. That's why we need to make people aware of that. And we need to fight that the data is used in a proper democratic manner. And in, in, in the book, actually, and we've always been cyborgs, I'm suggesting a way, a democratic way of using digital data, because I think that's that's the most pressing and the most relevant uh, social questions we are currently facing. Yeah. <clears throat> well, as we come up on our time here and 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 are talking about that, do you want to kind of finish off by telling us a little bit about some of your ideas and the solutions, or maybe some of the ways you think we should navigate the transformation with data? As, as so, firstly, I want to stress. I mean. 
I think what I try to convey, uh, what I try to highlight is really, um, so firstly, the impact of emerging technologies, digital data, all that, that's something which concerns all of us. Mm -hmm. Ignoring the issue is something which we can't do. You might not wish to embrace the transhumanist stance, but you need to take the issue seriously. It, these emerging technologies have an influence on in all aspects of our life world. And, and that concerns economical issues, you know, military issues. It also concerns artistic issues. I've just published my most recent book, actually, which just came out a month ago. It's entitled Philosophy of Post-Human Art. And there I give a you know, comprehensive uh, view concerning a, to take how, how we deal with post-human arts, what are post-human arts, bio art, crypto art, I, cyborg music, and so on. Um, deep uh, music created by uh, uh, by by by, um, by algorithms um, and so on. So that's so it really concerns all the different aspects of our of our life. Well, we need to take this issue seriously. The most important issue is the ones concerning how we how we how we deal with digital data and and the stance which I am trying to promote is or which I find I don't like it myself but I, I have nothing better to offer. It's an as good as it gets solution. And um, because I see the counter arguments in a strong manner, and I see, the, I, I, I see the varies which go along with the counter arguments and I feel them, but I think it's a practical necessity to approach the issue in, the, in, the, in, the, in this way. Um, I think if, if, the, if, the, if the big companies have the right to collect the data, it will turn them into political players. And that undermines our, that undermines basically our liberal, um, liberal democracies. So um, as a counter solution, um, I, I, I suggest, no, it should be liberal democratic governments who get granted the right to collect the data. And, 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 and namely personalized data. And basically, but if they collect the data, then you know you could always wonder, you know, then they, the people who have the right to access the data, could use it in their interest. And you, humans always have a tendency of, you know, using things in their interest. And and they all, it's easy to get corrupted in, once you're in a position of power, in particular. And so um, the best way to deal with it is sort of an algorithmic processing. Um, these digital data should personalized data should primarily be processed by algorithms. And, um, and then the depersonalized results and of the data um, can get passed on, can get sold to other companies. And for, because they are of enormous relevance for research in natural sciences, social sciences, uh, for innovation purposes, for, you know, public for public policy making, they are of enormous relevance. And so here it's, it's, it turns, um, it turns the government into the traders, but the government, um, and um, by the government dealing and selling the digital data, one could wonder, well, isn't the government then expropriate us? Don't they take us away because, you know, digital data being intellectual property, don't they expropriate our intellectual property if they force us um, to give up our digital data? And you could, and that's a strong argument. Um, however, in, in these circumstances, then it becomes important to realize what do most people actually care about? They care about an increased health span. And an increased health span can get dealt with best by means of a public health insurance. That's why I think a public health insurance is in all of our interest. And it, it's, it's up to the government to provide us with that. But a public health insurance is enormously costly and it needs to be financed somehow. And you know, and, and, and the new technologies obviously make the make the medical technologies also more and more 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 costly. And the you know the the more money you you put into it's usually the better medical services can be provided. And so the financing of the public health insurance is is a, is a crucial crucial matter. And so here the solution is by the government becoming the you know the trader of digital data, selling the you know uh, collecting personalized data, selling the depersonalized uh, data to companies and so on. And the money which is being made as a consequence of these transactions should be used in a democratic manner, in a proper democratic manner, namely by financing the public health insurances, the public health insurances. Though, though all the people can benefit 
um, from from that because it's in you know more than 90 percent of our interest to have an increased health span that's why it's in our interest and so individually you know selling our data individually it doesn't work we are not you know it's it's individual data is completely irrelevant it only matters if we've got you know big data and the big data and so here um, but it's only justified, you know, to 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 take away because it's not a taking away of our intellectual property. Here it is. It is we pay for something which we cherish. We cherish an increased health span, and we pay for the public health insurance. And we pay for the public health insurance at least partially um, by means of our digital personalized digital data. And that would be a proper democratic use of our digital data. Rather than Facebook um, getting richer by collecting the data, we would have a proper proper democratic use of digital data if the government collected our personalized data, processed them by means of algorithm, then they were sold to companies for research purposes, and the money goes into the financing of a public health insurance. I think that's, yeah. a, you know, it has some risk, but it's the best solution I can put forward. I mean, I like the I like the idea of our own data becoming a way that we fund our healthcare. You know, the fact that we could be kind of using our data as a way to to take care of our society. That's it's a good idea if we can have a government that doesn't then you know become totalitarian with that data. Uh, Stefan, man, I think we're past time here, and I want to respect how long we set aside to to have this conversation. Um, do you have any closing thoughts that you want to talk about? We'll obviously link people to your books and whatnot, but uh, uh, last word before we before we call in into this. Yeah, just to you know, I hope people realize that sort of by embracing the new technologies and by cherishing the norm of negative freedom, we can really create a society where the great plurality of different kinds of flourishing can be realized. But we need to be very careful that no, you know, totalitarian, paternalistic, fascist structures come about because there is an, as you rightly said, if you know the wrong leader being having access to the data, it could lead to to a totalitarian system on an unprecedented scale. And there is a worry, but not collecting the data is not not the better option because then they will be collected, you know, from other countries who might not have cherished the same political ideals which we cherish. So we this is an issue which we all then the best minds of our generation need to think about. And um, we need to take seriously and rethink the meaning of digital data. I'm very much looking forward to exchanging these um, these ideas with, with all of you. Wonderful. So many thanks. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>